So hello, uh, my name is Alberto Sonino from University College London, and I'm going to present you coconuts, threshold issues, selective disclosure credentials with applications to distributed ledgers. So before we start, uh, there is a little sentence that I have to read you. So I recently started working at Facebook, but this work is work that my colleague and I did under the auspices of our work at UCL. It has nothing to do with Facebook. Uh, the technology is open source, and you can use it, uh, feel free to use it. So um, as a side effect of this, uh, there won't be any open Q&A at the end, but feel free to come and speak to me offline afterwards. So this is joint work with my colleagues Mustafa, Bano, Sarah, and George, all from uh, UCL as well. And so, so here is how the story goes, right? So among the many challenges that we have in blockchains, we are looking toward the poor privacy that they have. So blockchains are great for high integrity structures, but adding privacy on there, it's often a little bit complicated. And the reason is, in the general uh, smart contract framework, as typically we can imagine, well, you have the smart contract, somehow you send it to the blockchain, it gets executed, and then anyone can verify it. That means that the smart contract code is public, and whatever is on the blockchain is also public, because that's how you achieve public verifiability. So we're not trying to solve any problem of privacy here uh, as a general. We're just targeting a more specific subset of the problem, which is, can we issue anonymous credentials in these settings? So particularly, what we would like to do is, Imagine we have a smart contract that takes some inputs. Those inputs would be some attribute. Those attributes can be public, but can be private as well. They go to the blockchain, and then somehow the blockchain gives you some anonymous credentials. This would be the first step. And then in the second step, you can take those credentials and go to another smart contract and use them to privately authenticate yourself and access some of the functions of a smart contract. So oh, all of this should happen in a distributed settings, uh, preserving all the properties of the blockchain and having privacy on top of it for the authentication. And so this is the problem we're trying to solve. So why is it hard? So as I said, all transactions are on chain and this creates the classic problem of you cannot have the sensitive attributes and the signing keys directly on the chain. And also, the credentials shown should be unlinkable. So you should be able to use your credentials multiple times by being unlinkable across usage of your credentials. And also, you should be unlinkable from the issuance of those credentials. So what properties do we need? More particularly, the first we need is blind issuance. This means that uh, when the authorities will issue your credentials, they don't have necessarily to see the content of the attribute they're signing. The first is unlinkability, as I said, so you can use your credentials multiple times and stay unlinkable across usages. And the third is actually the selling point of coconuts, which is threshold issuance of authorities, which means that in traditional settings, you only have one issuer. Here, what we do is you have multiple authorities, each of them will issue a piece of the credential, and then the user can aggregate them locally. The authority should not interact with each other, uh, so the, the signing or issuing process should be extremely simple. And we want the credentials to be efficient and all zero knowledge proofs associated with the credentials should be efficient as well. And so that's why we build coconuts and those are all the property we basically achieve. So what is it? So we have two main contributions here. The first is the cryptographic scheme, the coconut credential scheme. And the second one is we build a smart contract library and some example applications on top of it, which I'll come to that after. So the very general framework, just to be sure that everybody's on page, you have a user, it issues some requests to a set of authorities, those authorities would answer back a piece of credential each, the user aggregates them, randomizes them, and then can show the credentials. It can show the credentials multiple times, but it needs to randomize them before. And so the threshold authority setting means that you have, let's say, N authorities, but actually only T of them are necessary, any T of them, so any subset of those authorities, are uh, required in order for the user to be able to re-aggregate T pieces into one consolidated credential. 
And so you can see now that this maps pretty well to the concept of BFT at least, where you can tolerate up to F malicious nodes. Well, then you can find a way to map that T, the number of authority that you actually need to be honest, to BFT setting where you have 2F plus 1 honest authorities on the blockchain. So um, this is the general structures of the credentials. So it's a mix between BLS signatures and uh, PS signatures from Poincheval and Sanders. And um, so I've been advised to not put any crypto on the slides, but so you will have only this, uh, which shows the internals on how they work. So you have um, an attribute M, so you can extend it to multiple attributes, but for the sake of simplicity, let's say you have only one attribute M. You compute a commitment and you hash them. So this is a deterministic. Once the user provides the commitment to every authorities, the authority hash it and gets the elliptic curve point H. This is uh, inherited from BLS signatures, for those who know. And then the, si the shape of the credentials are similar to PS signatures, which is H and H to the X plus and Y, where X and Y are the private key of the, of the authorities. And so this is the communication protocols and how the flow would work. You have the user that would send some cryptographic material to each of the authorities and some predicate phi. The predicate phi and would come with some zero knowledge proofs by saying that whatever attribute is encrypted inside lambda actually satisfies the predicate. Then the authority would answer some part of the credentials. What they would do is they would exploit the homomorphism of the way of lambda is built in order to make the credentials on top of encrypted values. The users unblind them, aggregates them, and then can send them to any verifier by sending again some cryptographic material theta and um, uh, a predicate phi prime potentially different and showing in zero knowledge that the attribute embedded in the credentials satisfy the predicate phi prime. So we have here the same approach that we may have for traditional software, right? So what we don't want is our smart contract creator to have to rewrite the cryptographic primitives of coconut all over again each time that they want to authenticate someone. So what we do is we provide a library, so four main functions, that other smart contracts can just call and reuse. And surprisingly, we can build a series of applications on top of it with very few lines of code just by recalling each time those four functions. So the first is very simple. The authority would go to the smart contract, put their, their public key, they would potentially advertise who they are. Then the user can call the request um, function which would tell to the authorities, all right, can you issue me some credentials on those enc uh, encrypted attributes? The third is issue. The authority would read that and issue part of the credentials. So know that these two doesn't have to happen on chain. We just put them on chain to show that actually there is no secrets that are involved there. So it's not a problem that the request of the credentials are on chain and that the part of credentials issued by the authorities go on chain as well. And the reason is, as long as there is one private random attribute embedded in the credentials, it's true that anyone can look at the ledger and aggregate the credentials, but no one would be able to use it because they wouldn't know the secret embedded inside them. And the last one is verify, which is very simple. It takes the credentials, output true or false, depending on if they verify or not, with respect to the create function, uh, which is the top one. So, here is an example application that we've built on top of it. So the goal here is not to say that we should or should not do privacy on blockchains. Uh, uh, well, privacy petition on blockchain, sorry. It's obvious that we should do privacy on blockchain. Um, the, so this is an example that just illustrates uh, a little bit how it works. So it's extremely simple. The first phase happens only once. The citizens would go to some authorities, show their, their identity in some way, offline or online, and receive back some credentials. So that's the first phase, then they go home. Afterward, anyone can go on the blockchain, create a new petition event by saying, whoever has the credentials from this particular set of authorities can actually participate to the petition. And then those citizens can come to the ledger and sign the petition. And there would be unlinkable with the issuing phase that happens only once, and they can actually go and sign multiple petitions and still be unlinkable across campaign. So what's out there? So we build the cryptographic primitive uh, in Python and we have a benchmark, but actually uh, from now there is also uh, two JavaScript libraries and one Go library that does the same thing. Uh, we build a smart contract library for Chainspace and Ethereum. 
uh, we built two applications, uh, a coin tumbler and the e-petition, and we also designed a censorship resistance distribution of proxy. And all the code is here and open source, so feel free to check it out if you're interested. That's the Python implementation. So um, signing is extremely fast. As you can see, it's only three milliseconds. Verifying the credentials takes 10 milliseconds. So this is due to pairing operation, but it's still acceptable to have them on smart contracts. The size of the credentials, so as you've seen, is very short. We have two elliptic curve point, no matter how many attributes and no matter how many authorities. And the communication complexity shows that actually this scales pretty well. So the request is ON, because in the worst case, you need to contact once every authority to get a, a piece of credentials. But verifying the credentials is O1, because once the verifier has the aggregated public key, it can just locally perform verification. We evaluated it with 10 authorities across the world by setting the client in Europe, and we see that latency is linear. So this is actually not linked to the cryptographic primitives, but more to network delay, because as you can see, the one close to Europe are close to the client extremely fast, and then it goes higher latency when uh, we go further from the client. So you can find many additional information on the paper. If you're interested, it's online. And we have two main limitations. The first is that adding and removing authorities is not so easy without running the key generation. So actually, adding is feasible by using some secret, proactive secret sharing techniques, but removing, I wouldn't know how to do it without running the key gen. And the second one is that we are working to see if we can have a key generation algorithm for threshold cryptography that actually leverage the high integrity structures of the blockchain in order to have its fault tolerance and still relatively simple. But it seems that some people from Definity have an answer to limitation due to by now, so there's still the work for us. So the next milestone would be we have now credentials. Would be nice to have a general framework that allows you to do any kind of threshold cryptographies, but it happens that this comes with challenges, so we currently don't know how to do it. So here is, that's it. So as a conclusion, two contributions are the coconut credential scheme, the cryptographic scheme, the smart contract library, and the examples application that comes with benchmark and implementation. And if there is only two takeaway is threshold uh, issuance is what makes coconut sweet for blockchains, and re-randomizations makes it multi-use and unlinkable across multiple usages. So thank you for your attention. Um, please come talk to me offline if you have uh, any questions.